Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 391, featuring the first in a brand new series of interviews with the great Chuck Somerville, uh, one of the great Apple II programmers. Uh, he's probably best known though for his game Chips Challenge, and also the uh, more uh, the later game Chuck's uh, yeah Chuck's Challenge. Uh, but he's done lots of other stuff, uh, really from the very early days all the way up to uh, modern times. He's also done a lot of work with LEDs. He's even worked on the Times Square Ball. I'm sure you've uh, seen some of his work if you uh, watch the New Year's Eve celebrations on TV. Uh, anyway, he's a really great guest. He's got lots of great stories to tell, and I think you're really going to love it. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Chuck Somerville. All right, folks, I am here with the great Chuck Somerville. Uh, Somerville. <laughs> Uh, the original Bitbuster, creator of Chip's Challenge, Chuck's Challenge 3, and of Greds in Space. He's worked on some uh, Epics classics as well, including Summer Games 2 and California Games. He's also done work for Electronic Arts and 3DO. On top of all that, uh, he's done some really amazing stuff uh, with card and dice games, LEDs. He puts on some fantastic Halloween shows. Hope we can get into that a little later on. Uh, also does a lot of art projects and Burning Man uh, related stuff. Really cool. He's literally built the Times Square Ball twice. <laughs> and, yep. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was trying to think of a word that might sum all this up. About the closest I'd come up with would be something like Imagineer uh, to describe you. Because you're. It seems like you're, you're like on the on the level of technology and technological projects that sort of paraphrase, or maybe just quote Arthur C. Clarke on this. This is a quotation I was thinking about uh, how any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable for magic. You know, yep. Looking at your Halloween videos and your wizard <laughs> you know, persona, you seem to be the kind of embodiment of that idea. Well, I'm glad you took the time out to look at some of those Halloween videos. I'm really proud of them. So, um, yeah, I've... Uh I seem to have had a uh, two major careers in the you know the gaming career and the LED career and the gaming career never quite died so that's why Chips Challenge 2 finally surfaced after like a 20 year 20 years in the vault I don't know it's if you know the story years, but we, yeah, yeah we, we'll talk about it. it seems to be that the longest any game has been from the time it was finished till the time it was released so <laughs> we can talk about that later if you want oh, we'll definitely get into that I said, why don't we just start at the beginning, though? Uh, you'd mentioned something about how you learned to, to program, and uh, I guess this is TAG, T-A-G, program, not sure what. Is that the name of a program yeah. or the name of a language? Or what is that? It's actually, it was a government experiment. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> A government experiment? This, this sounds government, promising. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is kind of interesting. I'm going to just kind of walk, walk around here. So... Um, when I was in sixth grade, um, way back, this was kind of before you could get a computer. I don't even know what the year was. Uh, anyway, they, um, there was a, a professor in my hometown at a teaching college that wanted to do a study to see whether or not it helped to give special um, resources to kids who are determined to be talented and gifted. And uh, I was selected to be evaluated for the program, and uh, I was selected to be in the program, and I was uh, put in the experimental group, luckily. Some of, um, many of my friends were also in the program, and some of them were put into the control group. But they had a separate school that we went to once a week, and they offered courses in pretty much anything that um, you could imagine. And if we could think up something we wanted to learn that wasn't in their, um, their course, they would come up with a way to try to teach us that, too. It was called the PACE Center. It's in Huntington, West Virginia, and uh, one of the courses they had was in computer programming. Now, the way they did this was they had a, a teletype terminal that was hooked up to uh, the uh, mainframe computer of the local campus, and we learned how to program on that. Um, and uh, I, w I was really fascinated by it because I realized here's a machine that can do anything 
that I wanted to do and will do anything I wanted to as long as I can explain to it carefully enough what it is I want it to do. And uh, when the program ended three years later, I got permission to stay, uh, to continue to have access to that computer. And my, uh, my dad was a, a serviceman for uh, IBM. He repaired typewriters and things. So oh, really? he, he helped us build, uh, he helped us build a, a terminal, a, a, tele a video terminal, and we connected with a modem to that computer. And eventually, the college got tired of me being on the science, the computer in the science building. And they moved me over to the math, the computer in the math department. And that's when I moved from a program. I was on a programming language called Focal, so I moved from Focal to Basic. And then uh, I started. Uh, he would take me over to the college once a week and to work in their their uh, computer lab, and I could work on the terminals there. But um, that was my first experience with computers. <clears throat> And um, I used to have um, paper tape and that, that I collected with my programs on it and things like that. Um, but when the first ad for the Apple II hit the first Byte, mag Byte magazine for the first time, uh, we were, I was already a subscriber, subscriber to Byte magazine. We ordered it. And I think I had a like serial number 354. And for one month, for one month, uh, Apple offered a board-only option, only for one month, um, and that was the, the when they initially started the or started selling them. So we bought the board-only, and we were able to hook the typewriter from our terminal up to it and get a power supply and a case that was an old IBM memory typewriter case, and that was the computer that I took to college, actually. Wow. <laughs> That's really cool. I guess it was serendipitous that your dad had, you know, all this knowledge. And, uh, well, he certainly uh, knew how to repair a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> well, it came in handy, right? Yeah. That's really cool. So how did you end up uh, over at Sirius Software? Is that where you published your first game, first uh, commercial? Um, well, that's the first one that, that mattered. Um, I had actually... Um, You've done many games before this. No, I hadn't, actually. I had done... Well, I'd done a little bit of stuff that nobody's ever seen that was released, released on tape. Um, there was a guy that uh, was trying to start a software company out of my hometown, and he found me, and I wrote a couple of dumb programs in BASIC, and they were released on tape, but it didn't turn into anything. It was when I started going to school at Georgia Tech that uh, I met a guy, in, uh, another freshman, I think, I think his name is was Mark Goodman, and he wrote um, Appaloids, and uh, which was hosted by Venture International, and he did a he was making pretty good money off of it, and I figured I could do something at least as good as that. So uh, that was in the back of my mind, and my uh, my friends um, said, you know, we're joking about making games, and I said I bet I could write a game in a half hour. So um, I wrote. Snake bite in basic in about a half hour. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and uh, but I mean you can't publish a game written in basic, so I, it had to be rewritten in assembly before I published it to Sirius. Um, and and they liked it. Um, actually, I submitted it to online first, uh, Ken Williams Company, and they said, um, well, it looks pretty good, but it needs something more. Um, and. Uh, so that's when I, I added the, the per Perilous Purple Plums, which wow. um, actually nobody likes the, nobody actually <laughs> pays with them. But I added them anyway, and then I sent it to Sirius, and Sirius took it. And then when I talked to Ken Williams about it later, he said, no, 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 you were supposed to add the stuff and then send it back to me, not add the stuff and send it to another publisher. <laughs> so um, well, did, it turn out anyway. to be good, did it turn out to be a good decision? Uh, it did. Uh, I really liked, um, I, you know, I got to meet Jerry Jewell. And because he was uh, the founder of, of um, you know, Sirius. And actually, let's, uh, here's my, my snake bite poster. Let's throw that in as a cameo. Um, so anyway, um, Jerry and I, uh, you know, um, Sirius imploded eventually, although I did get a chance to get Reds and Space in before they imploded. Um, and Jerry took a position um, as a project manager at epics and he invited me to go with him so uh, so i did i was uh, I, I was trying to start a new career at a uh, company making uh, newspaper rendering software at the time but i really didn't like it <laughs> uh, 
So anyway, that's um, that's how I ended up at Epics. Yeah, Snake Bite. I'm pretty sure I played that. I noticed it's out for. I guess you released it for about five different systems, or at least four here. I'm pretty sure well, I played the Apple II version. That's the one that I wrote. All the rest of them were ports by other people. Yeah, I seem to remember it was on. I think that my school had this Franklin computer. <laughs> if I'm remembering that right, and that was uh, one of the games on there. That's so very few people. So yeah. very few people have actually finished all the levels in that. How many but levels I, I are would, there? There are 29 levels. Um, and I'd like to um, say here that I was totally blown away by one of the few people who finished it. it was John Romero. <laughs> Well, wow. yeah. And he, he actually, you know, he said that I guess he want, he did it as a bet. But he's one of the few people I know that, that finished it. And uh, John and I later became fans because he wanted to make a, you know, get together all his Apple II heroes to have a big party. And that's when I got to meet him in person. Yeah, and as he contributed all of the, uh, the Moby Games entries about your games. Oh, did I he do that? I looked down there like the snake bite. I was like, you know, listed, who wrote the article about this? I'm like, John Romero. I was like, is it that John Romero? Yes, of course. It's, it's that, that John Romero, Romero yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, you know. He's really done a lot to help uh, preserve the Apple II community. Yes. <clears throat> well, let's get a little bit into Grudge in Space. Uh, this is 1983, according to Moby Games, which I guess that would be Romero. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Grudge so, uh, I'll go, go ahead. Okay, so what happens with um, Grudge in Space was um, by, by the time, so I was going to school at Georgia Tech when I wrote Snakebite, and I was on a, kind of an intern program at IBM in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was also receiving free copies of the Epics catalog because I was one of their published authors, and they sent me um, Blade of Blackpool by uh, Chris Wilson, and I played Blade of Blackpool and I thought, you know, I could <laughs> if they're willing to publish this game, I, I think I can do it at least as well. So um, I, needed, I knew I needed help because I, I wasn't going to be able to do the artwork. And uh, another student um, that was a good friend of mine, uh, Joe Dudar, had, um, he had basically dropped out. And he didn't have anything to do. And his life was going nowhere. So I said, hey, why don't you come join me? We'll go back to my hometown in West Virginia. And we'll rent an apartment, and I'll write this game, and you do the artwork, and we'll publish it through Sirius. And Sirius, I'll get Sirius to sign all my papers saying that I'm an intern there for the summer. Um, and he said, oh, okay. So he borrowed $500 from an uncle, and he came. And, and we spent the winter writing the game. Um, and then the following spring, it was published. And then during the following summer, um, Sirius had contacted me. They wanted it ported to um, the Commodore 64 and to the Atari 800. So uh, my summer internship was actually at Sirius, porting to those two platforms. At the end of the summer, they liked my work so much that they offered me a full-time position. So I thought, okay, so I can either stay in California and making video games, or I can go back to school and spend money on school. So I decided to drop out of school. So <laughs> I never went back. Yeah. You know, I, I, I went for a summer internship and, you know, I just never re-enrolled. So, you know, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I wonder if your school sent any more interns out there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, what did you, how did you learn how to program? Was it pretty much the same thing on all these different platforms or was it a big learning curve? Or did you, um, you're just such a genius, you just sort of instantly grokked it or... Well, I, I was really lucky in the case with the Commodore 64 and the, uh, the, the Atari 800 that I was, on, I was there in the offices at Sirius, and there were other programmers there that had worked on those machines. So I got, they had the development systems already available, and I was able to you know, learn some of the ins and outs of the hardware registers and the different specifics of the machines through those. Um, <clears throat> Probably the, the most challenging part on the Commodore 64 version was the, actually also on the Atari version, was the dithering of the lines of colors to try to get a wider color um, spec um, palette that the Apple had. So uh, it turned out that Tim Wilson had written that uh, interleave color um, program on the Commodore 64 already, 
And uh, so I was able to borrow his code for that. Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> you didn't tell him you were trying to do, you could do much better than Blade of Blackpool. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't tell him. I didn't say that to him. <laughs> oh, that's great. Tim's a great guy. Tim's a great guy. You know, he ended up being um, a uh, the CTO at EA. Oh um, wow! So, uh, or as he's put it, one of the CTOs. <laughs> oh. So anyway, uh, yeah, I I worked with him. You know, when he when he was there at EA as well. So, where did you get the some of the inspirations for Dreads in Space? I, I was reading some of the copy <clears throat> from the manual and the box and. Yeah, I sort of picked well, up on a sort of a Douglas Adams vibe. I mean, were you reading any you know, hikers? That and- that was all that was all Joe Dudar. Joe all I Dudar. did was write the code. Joe Dudar wrote the story and did the art. So I was just uh, I was just the code monkey. <laughs> but but I did write um, a compiler um, that used the AppleSoft um, f- used the AppleSoft source files um, because AppleSoft would tokenize its um, its language. So when you looked at uh, the binary of an AppleSoft file, um, it would have you know a single number for the word print, you know, as a token. So I wrote a, a parser that would read an AppleSoft file and then turn it into my own interpretive language um, for the game. So uh, so I actually used the Apple's text um, AppleSoft text editor to write the files, then ran them through an interpreter or ran through the compiler to turn it into the bytecode. So it was kind of a cool technical achievement, but you know, as far as the story and the art, not nah, wouldn't me. Well, it turned out really well, I think. Oh, well, okay, yeah. It, <laughs> it, it, I, it, you know, it's, I got my 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 first sense that I actually had a fan with that one because I got a I got a letter from somebody who, um, well, there was. There was an article in Heavy Metal Magazine about it, which was I thought, "Wow, well, I'm <laughs> Heavy, Heavy Metal, Metal Magazine." And then, and then I get then I got a letter from somebody in prison saying that uh, he wanted to <laughs> learn more about making uh, adventure games, and he had a, he had access to a TRS-80. <laughs> Did he turn out uh, to do any games? Or that... uh, I never I never <laughs> responded to his email. I don't know, it just made me a little bit nervous. Oh sure. You were telling me earlier that the the Grudge was the logo for the company, right? The, it is here. Let me. Uh, yeah, it's on the, this is that <laughs> view there. So that's that's the Grudge. Oh, wow. um, so now, yes, yeah, we thought it would be a better sell job. Joe and I talked about this. If we could, um, you know, say to them, "Hey, we'll we'll do a game based on your uh, your company logo." <laughs> so you'd already mentioned that you, you know, you got to Apex via your. Your connection there it's serious did you how would you compare those those studios oh uh, epics well you know in the early days everything felt kind of um garage garage alike but um epics was was um I, there was much more camaraderie I, I think the thing at serious i was never really accepted as like one of the guys hmm. i was just this this person on the side that that nobody really paid much attention to. Um, at Epix, um, I came in kind of, I was an employee, but I was really working on a specific project when I came in. Um, Jerry brought me in to do summer games on the Apple II because you know, I'm an Apple II expert. And it turned out that most of the guys at Epix weren't Apple II guys. They were graduating to the Commodore 64, but they were really from the Atari VCS um, stuff. So, um, they when I made Summer Games on the Apple and actually wrote a sprite engine for it, um, they were really impressed. And so, when I went in to work in their offices full time, I already had street cred there. So, you know, they they gave me a lot more respect than I got as serious. That's all for this week's episode. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Sorry, it's uh, been a while uh, since I done uh, since I did an episode. It's a little hectic here at the university with all the uh, final exams and everything coming up. So, 
you know, I do match that kind of as a sideline. It's a moonlighting, if you will. Uh, so if from time to time, you know, you don't see a couple episodes, you know what's what's going on. Uh, I will say, though, I really need your help uh, to keep this show going. Uh, for whatever reason, my Patreon support has uh, started to go down. Uh, I wanted to get it up to 500 so I could offer transcripts. I get this all the time, uh, not just from uh, Matt Chat viewers, but a lot of people are interested in the interviews. They just don't want to watch a video. Uh, they'd rather just read the transcripts. Uh, I fully... Uh, you know, I, I support that. I think that'd be great. Uh, but I have to pay people to uh, transcribe these things. It's actually a lot of work uh, to do that. But anyway, uh, I need to get to at least the 500 mark to offer that service. And I used to offer it, and then the support went down again. So it's kind of up and down again with this uh, Patreon. Uh, you know, I don't get complaints about the show, so I'm guessing it's just guys that uh, run into some financial troubles or whatever. Uh, so I don't want anybody to go broke supporting uh, Mad Chat, you know, nothing like that. But, uh, you know, guys, if you uh, are supporting the show, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you uh, so much. It really uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, if you want to go up to from a dollar to two dollars, you know, that would be really great. Uh, or if you, uh, you know, if you haven't supported the show, but you uh, like, <laughs> like the episodes, uh, please step, uh, step up to the plate there. Uh, I love doing these interviews with uh, people like Chuck. Got a lot of uh, great stuff in the in the pipelines. Even got Leonard uh, from Troika coming on uh, here in a few weeks. So lots of great stuff. I just need you guys, uh, your help to keep these uh, episodes coming. So uh, please go to that Patreon site and go to matchat.us. Uh, lots of ways to support the show, uh, including, uh, and I haven't mentioned these in a while, but since it's getting uh, near Christmas time, you know, I am an author, <laughs> and I should probably plug these books a lot more. Uh, I just don't like the plugs and the, and the ads. But uh, if you are looking for gifts for yourself or for somebody you know that likes games, you know, we've got a bunch of books here, Vintage Game Consoles, uh, Vintage Games uh, 2.0. This is a really good book, really proud of that one. Of course, the old classic, uh, Dungeons and Desktops. Uh, Shane Stax and I are actually redoing uh, this one, uh, so it'll be updated soon. And then, uh, uh, let's see, also, uh, Honoring the Code, uh, this is, if you like Matt Chat, this is actually some of the transcripts ended up in this book uh, before I just started offering those uh, for free, but there's you know, some nice introductions in there. And uh, anyway, I think you'd really like these books. I get a lot of requests for people to uh, sign these. Uh, that's fine. Uh, you, probably the best way to do that, just let me know you want to sign copy. And then I can save you a little bit, a little bit of money by ordering it from Amazon myself. Get it sent here. I get the free shipping, and I'll sign it, and then uh, just send it to you, and you can uh, reimburse me for the, uh, the the book and the shipping. So it'll probably save a couple of bucks at least that way. And uh, you know, if you live overseas, it'll be more for the shipping, but I'm sure you know that. But anyway, I'm happy to do it. I <laughs> I just really uh, want people to read these. You know, put a lot of uh, love and, and energy into these books. So it's. Uh, you know, I hate the thought of just nobody uh, being able to get these. So, so if you want it, uh, just let me know. We can make it happen. Uh, or, of course, you can just go to Amazon and then buy it yourself. So uh, whatever you like and however you support the show, uh, just know that I really appreciate it. And it's uh, uh, <laughs> really grateful to you. <laughs> uh, maybe that's somebody that wants to sign copy. You know? uh, just the wife. Okay, uh, let's see. What about that news from the Matt Cave? Let's see. Um, okay, here we go. So this is, a, I thought this was really cool. So I know a lot of you guys love uh, Wolfenstein 3D. Uh, well, here is a version of it for the Commodore 64. It's a super CPU release. Uh, let's see. The sources have been modified to allow building for 32-bit targets like the MIPS CPU recompiled to 65816 code. Uh, let's see, it's uh, recommended for real hardware, and some parts have been rewritten for this similar 65816 for better performance, and so on and so forth. I don't pretend to understand all the details here, but I thought uh, some of you guys might be fascinated by this. Uh, uh, Wolfenstein 3D, I'll post a link to that. This is a Wolf 3D version 1.1, and I got that from Indie Retro News Blog. 
All right, next up, I uh, remember uh, my interview with Don Wilkins. That was back in episode 356. He's out with an update about his game Stellar Tactics, and it's a pretty big update. <laughs> uh, he's uh, released a combat patch for it that now allows a full 3D flight for space exploration and combat. <laughs> so apparently Don uh, was sitting around playing. I guess he thought this would be a huge thing to move it from 2D to 3D, but he was tinkering around uh, with, uh, I guess, Unity and uh, discovered it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that hard to do. So uh, it's going to be 3D uh, combat now uh, for space exploration. Uh, so it sounds really good. Uh, definitely head over there if you're um, you know, interested in stellar tactics, but... If you don't know what I'm talking about, just go back and watch episode 356. Uh, and then finally, uh, my, our friends over Game Banshee, uh, they've posted this uh, uh, about Beamdog in their latest Twitch stream. This is Trent Oster and Phil Daigle uh, talking about Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition. Uh, they got a lot of uh, information there, updates about it. Uh, I'm pointing you at the Game Banshee site because there's a nice little summary of all the highlights from the video in case you don't want to watch the whole thing. A lot of uh, interesting tidbits there. Uh, one that I'm kind of interested in is, is what they say they're, they're planning on down the road. They're going to be making some new resources and content, quote unquote. Apparently that will cover some new modules, but you know, there's lots of uh, other possibilities I was kind of playing with. You know, what, what would I like to see? in a Neverwinter uh, Nights Enhanced Edition. Sure, you could think of a few things, but you know, it might be a, time, might be a good time to make some suggestions, uh, suggestions to them. Uh, but anyway, definitely head over there to Game Banshee and check that out. All right, I think we should wrap it up with a quotation. And uh, I found this one I liked. Uh, this is from <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. It goes something like this. I think you'll enjoy it. If I were two-faced, would I be wearing this one? See you guys next week. Wayne, um, what do you do if every time you see this one incredible woman, you, you think you're gonna hurl? I say hurl. If you blow chunks and she comes back, she's yours. If you spew and she bolts, it was never meant to be.